Man, it's a great privilege to be back here, Living Word. I don't always get asked back. This is a real treat. Man, great. So I'm excited. I, I really have been excited about coming and have some things that I believe the Lord has given me to share with you. Just things that have uh, changed my life and I've seen it change the lives of other people. And I know that that's what we're all here for. You know, if all it was was getting your sins forgiven so that you wouldn't die and go to hell, but instead you'd go to heaven, most of us could quit. We've already received that. But man, there's so much more to understand about what God has done and how to receive from Him and how to live this life, not only so that we can prosper, but so that we can be used of God to touch other people. And so I know that many of you are here looking for God to do something, and I believe that you're going to have an awesome time this week. And if you remember last year, and I, I know that you've slept since then, but in case you were here last year, I taught on spirit, soul, and body. This is the thing that just transformed my life. And I'm going to continue, kind of start where we left off last year. I know that this, you know, in a sense is self-centered or uh, I know that many of you have got a lot of other things to think about except what I taught last year. And even if you were here, you might have forgotten all of it. But I'm going to assume that some of you got something out of it. And so we're going to use that as a foundation and go a little bit further. But this is what I taught last year, and it's really awesome. It'll change your life. And Mike, I'll let you give this to somebody. And then one of my partners in Germany, he got so blessed by that book that he took it and animated it. And so this is my teaching on spirit, soul, and body animated. It's me preaching, but he animated. It's really awesome. And uh, this is just a 15-minute version. It's a condensed version. But we've been having lots of people get blessed. Kids love this. And so this is a great thing. It's an animated teaching on spirit, soul, and body. And it's really neat because when it shows the three parts, when the spirit gets born again, he turns from this guy that's got a big old pot belly to a <laughs> six-pack. Amen. So anyway, this is good. So I'll let Michael give that to somebody who looks like you need a six-pack. <laughs> I put some pressure on Mike there. <laughs> Again, let me just say thanks, Mac and Lynn, for having me. This is such an honor to be here and to get to share. And, you know, we were visiting about, uh, I was ministering last week, and it was in a kind of a rough situation where a guy was preaching everything. Uh, he was countering everything that I was teaching. And we were just talking about it. And I said, I'd never come into a person's church and just, you know, try and mess up everything that they've done. They've labored here for 30 years. And man, I want to come in and be a blessing and add to it. Matter of fact, Happy Caldwell said it this way when he came to our Bible school to minister. He says, I'd never come into a man's field and plow crossways. <laughs> I thought, you know, that's a good way of saying it. But man, I'm here to, to be a blessing and, and we're all different and I've got a different perspective. And, you know, I'm just sharing what God is put in my life. But boy, I really agree with what uh, Mac was saying during the offering. We, you know, so many people, this is a strange position for me because for about 40 years, I've been preaching on grace when grace wasn't cool. <laughs> and I've been kicked out of places. And that's the reason I'm saying, what an honor to be invited back. <laughs> and uh, so I've been pulling people towards grace for 40 years. And now I'm pulling people the other direction because they're sitting here saying that grace has uh, enabled me to do all of these things. And there's a balance towards all of it. And that's what Mac was talking about tonight. Man, I am a rabid, deliberate giver. But you know what? I don't do it to get God to bless me, to get God to do it. I do it out of love and thanksgiving for what he's done. And Really, the, uh, the difference between a law, a work of law, which Romans chapter 3 talks about, that's what caused the Protestant Reformation is Romans 3, 27 and 28 when Martin Luther saw that. And the work of faith, which 1 Thessalonians 1, 3 talks about a work of faith. You know, if you just say that man works are wrong, well, there's a work of faith that the Bible talks about. And the difference between good works and bad works is the motive behind it. And that's what Mac was uh, addressing. 
If you give in order to get God to do something, that's the wrong motive. And that's a work of the law. And that's putting faith in yourself. And it makes you vulnerable to the devil because I can guarantee you, regardless of how good you are, you may be better than I am, but who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? We've all sinned and you can't trust your own goodness. And so if you are doing the right things in order to make God do something, then that's what the Bible calls law. And that is totally against grace. But if a person says, man, God has touched my life and now it doesn't matter what I do, then you don't have any works of faith. And that's what James chapter two is talking about. Faith without work is dead. And so it's really not what you do. It's the attitude you do it in. If you're doing it to get God to respond to you, then that's a law, a work of the law, and that profits you nothing. But if you are doing things because God, you've already done it, but man, I love you and I trust you and you're doing it out of a heart of love. If it's a, if it's a labor of faith, then that's a godly thing. So anyway, uh, I want to get into what I believe the Lord wants me to share this week. And I'm going to, again, start where I left off last year, which I know is ambitious because people have other things to do than think about what I ministered last year, all year long. <laughs> and there's probably a lot of you that weren't here last year. But anyway, real quickly, I just shared that the Lord showed me that when I got born again, it was my spirit that was changed, not my body and not my soul. And this was a major breakthrough because scriptures that say, you know, that you are the righteousness of God. I'd go look in the mirror and I'd think that's not righteous. And I'd look at my mind and my thoughts and that wasn't totally righteous. And because of it, I was just stuck. It was like, God, I can't understand the word. And when he showed me that it's not my body and it's not my soul that got changed, it was my spirit. And he showed me who I am in Christ and what I had in Christ. It totally revolutionized my life because God is a spirit and God sees me in the spirit and he relates to me in the spirit. And even when I sin and even when I fall short, even when I mess up, God does not change in his attitude towards me because he's a spirit and he's dealing with me in the spirit. And my spirit is sealed and sanctified and perfected forever. We talked about all of these things last year. So... <laughs> Anyway, I've never just continued a teaching from the year before, but that's what I'm doing this time. So anyway, let's turn over to Genesis chapter one. And if all those things be true, and if you were changed, here is one of the applications of this that just totally changed my life. I touched on this last year again. Uh, for those of you that could remember that far back, I touched on this, but I'm getting a lot more revelation on this. And even last, I think it was October the 4th, of last year, I was watching my own television program, which is strange. But you know what? If you were on television, you'd watch yourself too. <laughs> you would. Anyway, I was watching myself. And I was teaching on some of these things and God spoke to me through me. It was really, <laughs> it was really weird. I was sitting there thinking, how does this happen? But it just shows you that God can take anything that you say and God can amplify on it and you can get different things. The same people that are here tonight can hear me say the exact same words and some of you will go home and get different things out of it. But God spoke to me through me and it was awesome. <laughs> and I just want to share some things with you here that compliment all of this about who you are in Christ and how that God already loves us and has done all of these things. In Genesis chapter one is where God created the heavens and the earth. And in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. 
And God said, Behold, I have given unto you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all of the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So there is a lot of things in those verses, but here's what I was wanting to point out. And this is where I'm wanting to start. And I'm going to be dealing with this all week long, but this is really simple. So please don't discount this just because it's so simple. We need to get a revelation of this. And if you get it, it will really change your life. But Adam and Eve were the crowning jewel of God's creation. And there's many scriptures that say that. Contrary to what a lot of people are teaching today, you know, we've moved so far away from scripture and we are, uh, we've exalted ourselves and, and all of these things. And anyway, um, there's a lot of people that will put animals and the snail darter and all of this environmental stuff above everything else. And, you know, a, a godly man will even regard the life of his beast. And so the scripture in Proverbs talks about, you know, that a godly person uh, is kind to animals and stuff, and we need to take care of the environment. I'm not talking about trashing it, but I'm saying that man was the crowning jewel of God's creation. And all of these things were created for his pleasure and for our pleasure, and we're supposed to have the dominion over them. Today, we see people that are putting animals and things ahead of people. You know, I just saw an ad this last week that showed these pitiful looking dogs that were just sitting there shaking and there was sad music and please help. And I couldn't help but think, I'd like to know the people that put out that ad. If they abort babies, then I got no place for them talking about, you know, pitying these animals. But there are people today that will pity an animal and do all of these things and yet they don't respect human life. So anyway, without me getting off on all of that any more than I have, let me just say that we were the crowning jewel. We were what God created all of this for. And even though we were the focus of God's creation, he created us last. He didn't create us first. Again, this is really simple, but think about this. If God would have created us first, did you know it was the fourth day that he created uh, land. It was either the third or the fourth day, you can read it right here, that he created land. If he would have created us first, we'd have had to tread water for three days. And then if we would have been created first when there was land and all of a sudden God said, let there be trees whose fruit is in itself and let there be grass and all of these things, we'd have had to been dodging all of the mountains and the trees and things like this. You know, the reason that God created us last, it's very specific. It's because he created all of these things for us and didn't create us until he had already made a provision for everything that we will ever need. When Adam and Eve were created, they didn't come to God and say, God, I'm hungry. And all of a sudden the Lord said, oh, I'll create you something to eat. No, he had already created. You know, in this verse, it says in verse uh, 29, and God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed and all of the fruit and all of these things to eat. God had already created this. He had already created the needs or he had already anticipated the needs of Adam and Eve. And before they ever existed, he created everything that they would ever need. They didn't get hungry and then have to go to God and God respond to them and provide food. They didn't say, God, I need to breathe. And he said, oh, I'll create air. He anticipated everything. And uh, I could spend some more time on this. I'll just say it and let it go. But he anticipated the needs of the entire human race. God has never created any more oxygen. He's never created any more food. He's never created anything new. The Lord rested. Right after this verse, it says in chapter 2, verse 1, the Lord rested on the seventh day. And when it says he rested, that's not talking about him being tired. It's talking about that it was complete. It was done. There was nothing left to do. And so he rested and immediately man entered into this supernatural rest 
that the Bible calls a Sabbath. Now, I talked on some of this last year, and I'm not going to go back over all of that, but Hebrews chapter 4 talks about a Sabbath rest. And many people are trying to keep a day and honor a certain day, which Sunday isn't even the Sabbath. The Sabbath is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday, but it's not the day. We now have the reality. The Sabbath was a picture and a shadow of something that was to come. Is what it says, Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. We now have the reality, and the reality is resting in what Jesus has done. And that's what Hebrews 4 is all about. So man entered immediately into this completion that God had created. And when Adam needed something, he didn't need to say, oh God, I need this. God has anticipated the need of the entire human race for all eternity until he gets rid of this earth and creates a new one. And there is nothing that we can do that can, you know, go beyond God's ability to supply. And God has already supplied it before we ever need it. Didn't get a lot of amens out of that. Many of you have never thought along these lines, but I guarantee you it's true. The Lord didn't wake up this morning and create a million new cows. He's never created another cow. He's never created another goat or a sheep. He's never created another tree. God does not create. He created in the beginning and then he rested. And it says in Hebrews chapter four that he that's entered into the Lord's rest has ceased from his works as God did from his. God is not creating anything. He has anticipated all of your needs before you ever had one. When Adam and Eve needed something, they didn't need to go ask God for it. God had already created it. And did you know that there was enough food on this planet when God created it that would have sustained every person who's alive now? There's only two people alive. And yet there was enough food for seven billion people or however many we ever grow to. There was enough oxygen for the whole world. He's never created new oxygen. Somebody's saying, well, what's the point? The point is that God has anticipated every need that you will ever have. And when you come into a need, it's not a matter of going and saying, oh God, I need you to do this. And you pray and then you wait on God to respond to you. God has already supplied everything you will ever need. You do not have to get God to do something. What you've got to do is labor to rest that God, it's already done. And that is a huge, huge difference. And what I want to talk about this week is uh, I've got a teaching entitled, You've Already Got It, So Quit Trying to Get It. And did you know everything that you need from God, you've already got it. And it's not out there somewhere. This is one of the things in that book on prayer that uh, offends a lot of people. I don't mean to be offensive, but it really set me free because I used to take Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 10 where Daniel's prayers were hindered for 21 days by the prince of Persia and Gabriel had to come. And so I would pray and break the powers over Minneapolis, St. Paul and clear a hole in the heaven so that our prayers could get up to heaven and stuff. And it finally dawned on me that I don't need my prayers to get up to heaven. God lives right here. That's the reason I bow my head when I pray so I can say, Father, amen. <laughs> that was an Old Testament thing, but in the New Testament, God has placed inside of you the same power that raised Christ from the dead. So when the doctor tells you you're going to die, you don't have to go and say, oh God, I need you to heal me. The scripture says, 1 Peter, uh, yeah, 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes you were healed. It's already been done. God placed on the inside of you the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Let me just turn over and read some of these. I could quote them, but man, you need to see this. Ephesians chapter 1. In verse, matter of fact, the book of Ephesians is unique in the way it ministers because it's ministering from this mindset that I'm talking about. You may not have read it this way, but it's really unique because instead of asking for something and pleading with God to do something, it's praying that the people would get a revelation of what's already been done. We aren't 
headed towards a victory. We aren't fighting for a victory and Father, I'm going to get here. We are coming from a victory. It was done at the cross. It is finished. And you don't need God to do something for you. What you need to do is learn how to believe and rest in what has been done and overcome your doubts and fears because God has already done it. And so the book of Ephesians is written from that standpoint. Just for time's sake, I'm going to skip through some verses. But in verse 3, Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How many times have you asked God to bless you? Or God to bless somebody else? The truth is you're already blessed. You can't get to be more blessed. You can't get God to bless you more. Now you can walk in more of the blessings of God. You can learn how to receive it and cooperate and appropriate what God has done, but you can't get God to bless you anymore. You are already blessed with all spiritual blessings. In the next verse, verse four, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Let me ask you, if you were chosen in God before the foundation of the world, is that God responding to you? He's already chosen you. He's already blessed you. He's already done these things before you and I even existed. This is hard for us to wrap our little peanut brain around. And we think, how could this happen? But I don't know how God does it, but he comes by it honest, I can guarantee you. And <laughs> he's blessed all of us before the world even began. He chose us. In verse five, he's already predestinated you to be conformed to the image of his son. In verse six, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath, hath means past tense, it's already done, you're already accepted in the beloved. How many people are fighting and struggling and trying to earn acceptance with God? You're accepted before you were ever born. He accepted Jesus and any person who chose to make Jesus their Lord is accepted in the beloved. Did you know that this exact word that's uh, translated accepted right here, it's only used twice in the New Testament, this Greek word. And you know the other place it was used? Luke chapter one, where the angel said, hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. The only other time this word was used was talking to Mary that she was highly favored. That's what this means. You are highly favored. And some people in here right now, you know, Mac was talking about this, that you are condemned because you know that you've done something wrong and you're feeling condemned and you don't feel highly favored. You don't feel accepted. And you are in the process of trying to get rid of this sin and get rid of this problem and do this in order to earn God's acceptance. But you are accepted in the beloved, not accepted based on your performance. You're already accepted. God loves you. God is excited about you. <laughs> 